my closer. Dynamic Christian Ministries presents Start Our Seven. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and I now it's time to sure. relax and spend time with God's people of from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. As always, we'll have lively Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your mm. dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. Good evening and welcome to our 69th show of Start Our Sabbath. We're so glad that you decided to spend time with us at the beginning of the Sabbath. Man, did we miss you last <laughs> Friday evening? Yeah. Our I Friday know. evening <laughs> seems so incomplete when you're not when we are not spending time with you. <laughs> That's right. And I'm not making this up. We really wish that you could have been uh, that we could have invited every one of you to Nancy's birthday party that we had Saturday night after church last week. We might have needed more food, but we had so much fun. Yeah. We had a house full of people, and we did have tons of food, but maybe not for everybody in our viewing audience. Yeah, not enough, but because uh, we have a big viewing audience. But we did have a big birthday cake. Indeed. It was almost the perfect party. We only wish that you could have been here with us, too. All right, enough of the mushy stuff. Tonight we want to remind you again that we're not here to keep the Sabbath or observe the Sabbath. We're here to celebrate the Sabbath. That's right, because the Seventh-day Sabbath is a gift from God to help us live healthier and happier lives. And as always, we want to remind you of your destiny. You were made in the image of God, and now, as a called-out child of God and a member of the Ecclesia, your destiny is to be reborn into the God family. The purpose of your existence is to live forever with the Heavenly Father and with His Son and our Savior, Jesus. So always remember that. Never forget your divine destiny because God loves you and we love you too. I really wish they could have all come to the party. Yeah, me too. But we'll do things like this in the kingdom. Make a note of this. In the kingdom, we're going to do this. Now, once again, we want to acknowledge the great technical support that we get every Friday night in order to put this show on the air. First, we have the genius Carl Knock tribe all the way from North Carolina. With the help of his assistant and main squeeze, Mimi, up in British Columbia. Carl not only handles our Facebook YouTube connection, he, he's also the webmaster for the two websites, Dynamic Christian Ministries and the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. And we have the super smart and beautiful Terry Lucenhide in California who handles our connection with Bill. How did Bill ever get such a smart and beautiful wife? How, how did Bill pull I this off? I don't know. You okay. know, Wes, with our technical people in North Carolina and California, we're truly a bi-coastal operation. You know, it's a good point, Nancy. This prompts a thought. He, you and I are the only people involved in the show who are truly middle American. The others are coastal elites while we're here in Big Sandy, Texas. All right. So thank, thank you to Carl, Mimi, and Terry. We couldn't do this show without you. Yeah. And uh, we've got, uh, oh, I forgot to show the picture. There's Carl. There's Mimi. Okay. And tonight we've got a great show for you. Uh, Nancy's going to talk about conversation. And Bill is going to talk about you need to shut up. You know, these two titles seem to be in conflict with each other. I'm sure they won't be. And, and Bill's segment tonight is what he was supposed to do on our show uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> Remember, we had these technical difficulties connecting with Bill two weeks ago. Remember right, that? and then we had the party and we skipped a show. So yeah. That means that Bill had no, wait, no, had no preparation to do this week. He got to relax all week. And you took my punchline. So, uh, yeah, he got to goof off for another uh, two weeks because of your birthday. 
Just well, that's right. Now I want to mention one other thing about my party. Uh, we're not done talking about this party. I thought we were No, we're just one now. more thing. Okay, one more thing. Last Saturday night, my sisters, Karen and Donna, gave me a surprise birthday party. And I want to thank all of you out there who sent me all the cards and messages on social media. And some of them uh, got sent to you uh, through snail mail, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And this was very thoughtful of you out there. So thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Okay, back to the show. Thank you. We told you what Bill and I are going to talk about. Well, Wes is going to talk about how the Catholic Church looks at God's law and it might just surprise you so you don't want to miss it so stay with us we think you're really going to enjoy all three presentations tonight let's open with prayer okay if you'll bow your heads please <coughs> our father in heaven again we are so grateful for the technology that you give to us so that we can get together electronically and be together with your called out ones your ecclesia throughout the whole world we're so grateful for this opportunity we really appreciate it we ask for your intervention, your guidance on what we do with the technology because sometimes it can be very difficult and very uh, uncooperative. So please help us with all these things to push all the right buttons and do all the things we need to do. But even more importantly, help us to have your love within the Ecclesia. Help us to show each other that we care about each other, that we are looking out after each other, that we're praying for each other and always rooting for each other. The love of God within the body of Christ is so important. So please help us to have it tonight as we study your scriptures and try to learn more about your word. We now commit this little get together into uh, your and uh, to, into your name, and we do it in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. And we haven't had any pushback on on sound or, oh, good. or video or anything. So either they're used to things not working well, or <laughs> everything is working well. <laughs> I hope so, because we couldn't even do the uh, five o'clock sound check. The uh, technology was so bad. Fell apart. Yeah, fell apart completely. But um, we're going to try a, an experiment tomorrow, or uh, no, not tomorrow, but Sunday. Sunday. And we're, we're, we think we've got an idea on how we can improve the technology a little bit. Okay. We're going to try. Before, and we're always trying. We're always trying to improve things. Before we get into our three segments, I'd like to comment on the passing of Senator John McCain. And this mentioning of a politician is so out of character for SOS because we just don't do tributes to politicians after their passing on this show. And the reason is because we don't take sides in politics on this show. I'm not a Republican, not a Democrat. I haven't voted in a federal election since 1980. But I've got to mention something about the late John McCain because I think there's a lesson that we in the Ecclesia can learn from this anecdote that I'm going to share with you. First of all, McCain had some horrible, horrible lies told about him in the 2000 South Carolina Republican primary. McCain was on the receiving end of a vicious smear campaign by other Republicans. And I've heard political pundits say that the South Carolina smear campaign was the reason why McCain didn't get to be the Republican nominee in the year 2000. Again, that was 2000. Let's fast forward to 2008 when McCain was the Republican nominee. During one of his town hall meetings, McCain handed the microphone over to a lady so that she could ask a question. And she said she had read that McCain's opponent was an Arab. And before she could finish her statement about McCain's opponent, McCain gently took the microphone from her and he said these words. He said, no, ma'am, he's a decent family man and a citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on fundamental issues and that's what this campaign is all about. He's not an Arab, end quote. Now, did you get that? He said, I just happen to have disagreements with him on fundamental issues. Please hold on to that thought. Now, because McCain had set the record straight by telling the truth about his opponent, he was later booed by some of his supporters at some of his rallies later on over this. Again, McCain remembered the past. He learned from the past. He had been on the receiving end of some horrible lies back in South Carolina in, in 2000. So he knew firsthand how wrong it was for one person to bear false witness against another. So in 2008, there was no way that McCain was about to take part in any lies being told about his opponent. Again, we're not supporting McCain on this show. We're not taking a side or any other politician. That's not our job. Politics is not our thing on, on SOS. And again, 
If you want to get involved in politics, that's great. I'm just pointing out that taking sides in politics is not part of what we do on SOS. All right, then why are we bringing this up? Well, because on this show, we have been on the receiving end of some smear campaigns. And not from just one religious organization, but from several. And forgive me for laughing, but I think it's ludicrous that a little mom-and-pop organization like this is on the receiving end of a smear campaign by these bigger churches. It's just ridiculous because we're nothing. We're just two people doing a show. And we're surprised for, <laughs> they even care. Yeah, we're surprised <laughs> they take the time. Right? There are church leaders and church employees and church members out there who hate what we teach on this show and for a lot of reasons. And here's just one. They get furious when we tell you that your relationship with Jesus is only between you and Jesus. It's nobody else's business. Again, totally between you and Jesus. And again, there is a role in the ecclesia for the ministry. We, we never want to diminish the role of the ministry within the body of Christ. It belongs there. But it's never the role of the ministry to get between you and your Savior, your Messiah. Well, these people get furious when we teach that you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So many of them don't like this because they want to insert themselves between you and Jesus and then tell you that you need to please them in order to be in the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, this is bogus. All right, here's another one that bugs them. They don't like it when we demonstrate that a ministry can be done without having to constantly beg for money and harangue the ecclesia to keep giving more and more dollars. On SOS, we don't ask you for money. We don't, we don't need thousands and thousands of dollars to put on this show. We don't have a million dollar studio. All we have is love for others and we hope quality content to give to you. So when these other organizations see us doing this show that doesn't cost us any money, they say, how dare these people set up an unpaid ministry uh, sitting at their dining room table and serving the brethren for free. How dare they? And, and people have actually asked the question, who do these people think they are on SOS? So that's why they keep blasting us. They say, Wes and Nancy get on their stupid cottage industry show and they say bad things about us. But here's the truth of the matter. We don't badmouth anybody. We don't say bad things about these other ministries. Here's what we say about them, and most of you know where I'm going with this. Like John McCain, we say we just happen to have disagreements with them on fundamental issues. In the same way that McCain refused to say false things about his opponent, we emulate McCain by saying we don't say bad things or false things about these other ministers out there. We refuse to say they're bad men. And it's not our job to bear false witness, and it's certainly not our job to judge them. Now, we do judge teachings and doctrines. And regarding our disagreements on teachings and doctrines, let me paraphrase John McCain again. We just happen to have disagreements with them on fundamental issues. That's all there is to it. And we encourage you to take the same stance. Don't take part in smear campaigns against those who you disagree with on doctrinal issues or even administrative issues. That's not why God called us to be in his ecclesia. God called us to have love for one another, everybody. And if you disagree with someone, that doesn't make him your enemy. Further, <coughs> excuse me, please do not concern yourself with the bad things that other people do. You just worry about you and the sins that you need to overcome because that's what I need to do. I don't need to concentrate on what other people are doing, their bad things. I need to concentrate on me and what sins I need to overcome because that's what all of us need to concentrate on. Can we agree on this point? Can we all agree that we should just love other people and work on overcoming our own sins? Can we agree on that? Talk to me in the chat room. Tell me if you disagree. The bottom line is that we've got to accept Jesus as our Savior. The bottom line is that we've got to obey God's laws. These are positive things, these two things. These are good things. And as we do these positive things in our Christian walk, let's forget all the negative things that are going on with other people. Let's be happy, especially on this day that we celebrate every week 
which is God's seventh day Sabbath. Let's learn the lesson of the late John McCain. Okay, Nancy, are you ready to go forward with your thing? I think I am. What do you got for us tonight? My wheel is working. Got your wheel working? All right. Tonight, I'd like us to think about these two questions. One, are we as Christians having the right conversations? And two, are we as Christians seeking to solve the right issues? Things seem to have settled down a bit, but for a while, I saw a lot of frustrated, funny or angry comments about the California ban on straws. We got one right here. Uh, and please look it up before you comment about it in the chat room. According to my research, in most cases, it's either the restaurant or the wait staff who are the ones who can get fined or in trouble for handing out straws, not you, the user. One meme was especially frustrating to me because I see this kind of justification so often. The meme said, are we fixing the right problem? And then it showed other important social issues like homelessness. I've seen similar memes that indicate we should not be focusing on helping immigrants because our ex-military are homeless. This type of meme can be summed up to me like this. We should not focus on this problem over here, even though this is the one we can solve, because there's this other problem over here that we need to fix. All right, fair enough. We do have to prioritize our problems uh, in solving them because we have finite resources. So let me repeat the following question though. Are we as Christians having the right conversations? Number two, are we as Christians seeking to solve the right issues? I think it's entirely possible that the answer is no on both accounts. And here's where I'm coming from. If the whole world, or even just a lot more of it, were to truly be brought to a relationship with Jesus, the other issues of the day would take care of themselves. That's right. This is a literal statement. Every social, economic, environmental, or political issue would be resolved by increasing the number of dedicated followers of Jesus. Hear me out on this. To support this, com uh, this concept, I would like to first offer Matthew 22, 37 through 39, where it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. A Christian, a follower of Jesus, is supposed to view everything from the vantage point of loving God with every aspect of our beings, our thoughts, words, hearts, minds, deeds, resources, everything. A Christian, a follower of Jesus, is supposed to view everything from the vantage point of loving his neighbor as much as himself. We know that God is love, we know he embodies true and perfect love, and it's called agape. And anyone who has accepted their role as a child of God and brother of Jesus is supposed to be about the business of agape love. He's supposed to filter every thought, every word, and every deed through agape love. If we were all to see through the lens and everything through the lens of agape love, no one would throw a straw into the parking lot or on the sidewalk. If all were to see through the lens of agape love, no one would dump trash in the ocean. If we were all to see through the lens of agape love, businesses wouldn't pollute the water near their plants. If we were all to see through the lens of agape love, we would all respect the earth that God put us here to care for, as we're told in Genesis 2.15. If the world were, be, were to be filled with Christian believers, it would immediately alleviate the problem of parents who leave children unattended in the car for convenience sake. A society of believers wouldn't leave their poor, their elderly, their veterans, their mentally ill, or their immigrants homeless. Abortion wouldn't even be a thing, and neither would rape or incest or poverty. If the world were to be filled with Christian believers, we generously and voluntarily share what we have with those who have less, those in need, in the same way that Jesus so generously and voluntarily shared, just as the early New Testament Christians generously and voluntarily shared what they had. We would do it because of our agape love for others. No, we'd never get into any conversation about whether or not they deserve it either. 
Instead, we would simply obey the law of God. And we would also find that the law of the land would be a truly love-centered law, not like law we have today. If the world were be to, to be filled with Christian believers, we'd constantly ask this question every time about every decision. Is performing this act showing love for God? Is performing this act a demonstration of godly love for my neighbor? So if every problem in this world can be fixed by increasing the number of believers, I have to ask, are we who call ourselves Christians focusing our efforts, our conversations, our Facebook posts on the right problems? Are we who call ourselves Christians focusing on solving the right issues? At this point, let me really be honest. No earthly government can legislate love. No earthly government can legislate peace or happiness or obedience. A metamorphosis of this magnitude takes a change of heart. It takes a brand new heart. It takes a heart of love. This is, this is the message of the gospel, that mankind is destined for something different, something better, something more than what mankind is capable of achieving on his own. Because on our own, we dump that straw or a whole bag of trash or, com or toxic chemicals on the land. On our own, we choose profit over people. On our own, we turn our backs on people in need because we don't like their kind or we feel that they don't belong. On our own, we choose self-interest over and over and over again. And this is what human nature is all about. This is Satan's influence. So governments go through the futile exercise of trying to regulate behavior and trying to legislate morality. And try is all they can do. And the little bit of success they experience is because some people at least don't want to go to jail. Or some people at least don't want to pay a heavy fine. Or some people at least don't want to be executed. Ultimately, however, governments will fail in this endeavor. Why? Because none of the governments of the world are of God. None of them. Because, the only, because only God's moral law is truly and completely based on love. And above all, because only God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us can legislate morality. This is what it takes to change our world. God's Holy Spirit, our Heavenly Father's own DNA living inside of us, His perfect law of love being acted out in us and in every individual person each and every day. And the more people who have His D DNA and are living a life of love, where every decision every day is focused on loving God and fellow man, the better the earth and everyone in it will be. We cannot fix the mess of this world with pithy memes or tight regulations on pollutions and plastics or with capital punishment or with stricter immigration laws or with the right leaders. We can only fix the mess with the gospel message and change hearts, hearts of love. Do you agree with me? If so, then let's ask ourselves again. Are we as Christians having the right conversations? Are we as Christians seeking to better solve the right issues? I submit that we could have a better focus. I submit that we could be having better conversations. Conversations that begin with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Also John 4.16-21. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in God, whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may be confident, we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he can see cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You know, when we love God and our fellow man, we take care of the earth as we were commanded in the beginning in Genesis 2, 15, where it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. When we love God and man, we focus on Matthew 25, 35 through 40, which says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit, visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Should we not then be known to be Christians by the fact that the major focus of our conversations is telling others about the love of God and the freedom through Jesus in person, on Facebook, and by all other means available? Shouldn't we be known for our conversations pro proclaiming the blessings of obedience to God's law of love? Shouldn't we strive to be heralds of the kingdom of God and the gospel message more than heralds of pro or con some politician or pro or con some political issue or pro and con some, or con some environmental issue or pro or con some social issue? Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting we never get involved in any other way. We should each do what we can. However, I hope that you will agree that only from the framework of changed lives, of love for God and love for fellow man, will we resolve pollution and global warming and divorce and addiction and corrupt politicians and fake news and greedy businessmen and any other thing you can list. So I suggest that we focus on having the right conversations, one that calls others to salvation and focus on solving the right issues that is hearts that need changing. And as always, I welcome your thoughts, comments, and questions. And you can write me at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org. Very good. Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, let's see. I think, uh, don't we have a commercial coming up now? I hope so. I hope so. Um, why am I? Ah, uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, sure. Is it just possible that God loves a mystery? When you read the Bible, do you ask yourself questions like, what was God saying or doing on this occasion? What does this event mean? Some people respond to these questions by saying, why does God hide stuff? Why doesn't he just come out and say what he means? At the Ronald Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a printable Bible study entitled, God Loves a Mystery. It was written by the late Ronald L. Dart, and he talked about these very questions. You can find this study and many more on the website of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. Our website is rldea.com. Our website has many informative and interesting messages by Ron Dart, who was one of the most effective evangelists of the 20th century. Again, the title is God Loves a Mystery at rldea.com. I love the music on that. Uh, we're getting ready for our second segment now, and I'd like to start off by saying that it's run by uh, the fellow, uh, it's going to be given by the fellow that runs the Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers Facebook group, which has over 18,000 followers. And last time I looked, it's getting close to 19,000. So this is Bill Lusenhide. Uh, we're going to have him come in from California. Our internet connection. And uh, Bill does a great job on Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. So we hope that you'll um, check I'm out Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers on your Facebook page. So uh, let's see. Uh, here we've got Bill on the line. Hey, Bill, how are you doing tonight on this wonderful Sabbath? Hey, Wes. Hey, uh, Mama. Mama, I'm on TV. I see myself on TV. <laughs> Hold on a second. Nancy, turn the volume back on that, if you would, please. Okay. Let's see if we can get this to work. Uh, hi, uh, is it the Sabbath yet where you are, Bill, at this time? I don't think it is. That's you know, it's around Earth, and, and we are still able to uh, uh, be working here in uh, the West Coast of the United States. And, uh, Not us. We should have stopped uh, 15 minutes ago. 
So, very good. Glad to have you on the show. What do you got for us tonight, Bill? Well, okay, Wes, thank you again for the invite and the ability to be with all of you here on Star Our Sabbath. And you know what? Let me just start off and tell everyone that you need to shut up. <laughs> We're going to talk about when to keep your mouth shut, but there is very important times that you need to shut up. And I kind of wanted to have that be a little bit of a shock to, to get your interest. But there's great wisdom in knowing when to speak and when not to speak. And there was a good reason why Jesus did not respond to his tormentors at the time of his crucifixion. He stayed silent. In fact, Jesus said this to any of us who live in the latter days. And that's in Matthew 10, verse 19. He says, when you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it will not be you that's speaking. It will be the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. And so some wisdom there. We need to listen to that small, still voice, maybe in all of our interactions with people, for what the Spirit of God from the Father would want us to speak. So, again, we need to learn to listen and to listen to the lead of the Spirit of God. But yes, knowing when to speak and when, when knowing when not to speak, it can save your very life. It can save your relationships. It can perhaps even save your job, maybe even your marriage. And frankly, it can even perhaps keep you out of jail. Innocent people, good people, who can trust in the legal system or trust in it, are many times hoodwinked during questioning by officials. Their whole job is to incriminate you, even if you're innocent. Remember that. So always be wise. And if under any type of formal legal investigation, always, always, always have a lawyer answer for you for your own protection. But it's important to remember that words have power. God created the entire universe through the use of words back in Genesis. And you can be a healer to others by your words, great destroyer by your words. Ask God to inspire you to say the right thing at the right time. And let us be, become like uh, Barnabas, who was deeply loved by many because he knew how to love and encourage others through his words. The world is in desperate need for love, so let us do what we can to spread the love that comes from our Father in heaven. Now, negative words can hurt not just others, but we can also direct those words through thoughts, or even say them out loud, towards ourselves. Negative self-talk, and that can be extremely harmful. Be careful about what you're thinking and saying in regards to negative things about yourself. Realize that the devil is about to try to destroy your self-image and have you forget who you are in the very image of God. And we have to remember, we should, that we are a gift from God for his purpose. Be mindful of it, that God only thinks positive things about us. So don't destroy yourself with self-talk. But we are made in his image, the incredible human potential being very sons and daughters of God. And remember that when we want to judge anyone, including ourselves, that God loves us. And we should love others and have proper self-respect and love for ourselves too. So let me give you a few scriptures of wisdom uh, that speak about shutting up. I mean, this topic is covered in many, many scriptures. I'm only going to hit on a few of them. might make a good a study for you sometime. Proverbs 14, verse 17 warns us, says, don't open your mouth in the heat of anger. So if you find yourself getting angry, you, you're getting red in the face, you're huffing and puffing, your heart's starting to beat, probably it's just a good idea to say, you know what, I retreat, and I'm not going to say a word. Some wisdom in that. Um, a, a quote, it says in verse 17, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked, of wicked intentions is hated. Don't open your mouth when you don't have all the facts. And that's in Proverbs 18, verse 13. And it's, it reads, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame to him. So, listen, a lot of news stories and things are floating around today, unverified stuff that's floating around on Facebook and all that. Hey, find out the truth. Don't repeat it. Uh, just because you happen to hear it, make sure it's truth always, and including our... Uh, personal interactions. Don't open your mouth unless you verify the story. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. Whoever is deserving of death will be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses, not just one. 
God demands a certain degree of accountability and um, verification when it comes to important matters. Now, don't open your mouth when you're tempted to joke about sin. Sin is a very serious topic to God. Proverbs 14.9 reads as follows. Fools mock at sin, ridicule it, but amongst the upright there is favor. So don't joke about some topics that are off limit. When it regards to sin, it's a serious topic. It's something that can mean our very uh, salvation is at stake. And so again, some things require a degree of sobriety. Don't open up your mouth when you're going to be ashamed of your words later. Proverbs 8.8 8 reads, All the words of my mouth are with righteousness, nothing crooked or, per or perverse in them. So don't open up your mouth when you're also tempted to make light of holy things. Not just the name of God, but other holy things as well. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Do not be rash with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. So think about what you're talking about. Think first. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, great advice. Let your words be few. And finally, let us finish over here at uh, Proverbs 21, verse 23. We're advised and warned. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. So in conclusion here, be wise and do not foolish in how we uh, communicate with each other. Always ask God for wisdom. Always let us be a good example with our speech. Very good, Bill. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Wes. Um, you got anything uh, good planned for tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, well, we do. And certainly, uh, what, we'll, we'll just put it this way. Um, a bad... A bad day Sabbathing beats a good day working any time, right? And so, Absolutely. So that's our philosophy. Right, you and uh, Terry have a really good Sabbath, Bill, okay? All right, you and Nancy as well. And all of you here watching and listening here at Starter Sabbath, we love you. We count you as our brothers and sisters. And enjoy your Sabbath day. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Alrighty, bye bye. Okay, I think we're ready to go into our next segment. We are, we are going to uh, start reading a letter that was sent to us by a member of the Catholic Church. And we're calling him David, uh, even though his name is not his real name. He hasn't given me permission to mention his real name. Let me read what uh, David has written, and I'm going to stop and comment from time to time. Because we're talking about tonight uh, how the Catholic Church uh, looks at God's law. And uh, David, I think, does a really good representation as a loyal Catholic, somebody who's, you know, studied the catechism and church doctrine and all that. He does a real good job of representing what the Catholic Church teaches. And then later on, we're going to quote some uh, things that some of you have sent in uh, by the Catholic Church. And here's what David writes. He says, Dear Wes, I took the time to hear your latest Start Our Sabbath. Of course, as a Bible-believing Catholic, the topic of the law is of interest to me. He said, I want to address the oft-mentioned passage of Matthew 5, 17. Wes, you said that to fulfill the law is not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. I agree. David says, for example, neither of us would say that the law is destroyed just because we observe the Lord's Supper in lieu of the sacrificial rite of the Passover and arguably on a different day. He says, even though we observe a brand new ritual and... Get this now, he says, and in a certain sense, discard the old, the Passover is not destroyed, but fulfilled. All right, let's stop there, because here's where I need to interject. Did you catch that phrase, discard the old, and then he mentions the Passover? And here's where I have to disagree with David's statement, that we have discarded the old, the Passover. And I disagree for two reasons. First of all, Many of us consider the Lord's Supper and the Passover to be synonymous. And I know that some of you out there don't agree with this. I understand that. Feel free to have a different opinion. No problem. Talk about it in the chat room. No big deal. I'm just telling you that on this show, we say that when we keep the Lord's Supper, we are keeping Passover. And why do we say that? Well, because when Jesus kept the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he made a statement. In Luke 22:15. 15, Jesus says, 
I have eagerly desired to keep this Passover with you. So here Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. He's about ready to take partake in the foot washing, the taking of the bread and the cup. And he says, I have eagerly desired to keep this Passover with you. Jesus, the way I see it, is he's calling that event a Passover. Now, keep in mind that this event that Jesus and the disciples are participating in, it's taking place almost 24 hours before the Jews are going to kill the Passover lamb in the temple. Almost 24 hours prior to that sacrifice in the temple, Jesus is calling the taking of the symbols of the bread and the cup and the foot washing this Passover. Now, just for fun, uh, here's a little historical footnote. And this is mentioned in the latest Bible Advocate magazine. I just read it uh, today, and I hurried up and added this piece of information into the presentation tonight. Back in the 1920s, the leader of the Church of God Seventh Day was a guy named Andrew Duggar. And you can find Duggar mentioned a lot in Herbert Armstrong's autobiography. Duggar was the one in Church of God Seventh Day who pretty much convinced the Seventh Day to stop keeping the Lord's Supper weekly or monthly or quarterly. He said it should be kept annually. And in his teachings on the Lord's Supper, Duggar also calls it Passover. Well, this caused all kind of confusion with the brethren because they thought of the Passover, something that the Jews were going to do on the latter part of the 14th, while the church was doing their thing with the symbols or the ordinances in the early part. And this confusion is one of the reasons why the Church of God Seventh Day doesn't refer to the Lord's Supper as the Passover. All right, a little historical thing. So if Jesus calls his taking of the bread and the cup and the foot washing the Passover, so do we. Now that's the first reason why I disagree with David on the point of discarding the old, the Passover. We don't discard the old, the Passover. We celebrate it every year. All right, let's deal with the second reason why we disagree with David on this business of discarding the old, the Passover. But first, why don't we take a uh, short um, uh, commercial break, and uh, we'll be right back in 30 seconds on the other side. Is it safe to assume there is no God, or even to assume he exists, but he's just not around anymore? You might think that God started Project Earth, but then moved on to more interesting things. And that might be a fair assumption, considering the mess that humanity has made of our planet. We even see in the Bible, there was a time or two when God got pretty miffed at what people had gotten into, and he considered ending the whole thing. At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a printable Bible study entitled, Eyes to See. It was written by the late Ronald L. Dart, and he talked about things you could examine to determine whether or not God really exists. You can find the study and many more on the website of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. Our website is rldea.com. Our website has many informative and interesting messages by Ron Dart, who was one of the most effective evangelists of the 20th century. Again, the title is Eyes to See at rldea.com. Hope you like that commercial. Okay, let's get back to David's letter. Here's our second reason for disagreement with David that we discard the old, in this case being the Passover. When Yahweh first instituted the Passover, he called it an eternal observance. We find that in Exodus 12, 14. Write that down, please. Exodus 12, 14. And here's what it says. This day is to be a memorial for you, and you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statute. Now, we say that Jesus never did away with the Passover. On this show, we say, rather, he moved it from the latter part of the 14th to the early part of the 14th. And, and I suppose this spring, we're going to have to look at this topic in more detail, uh, you know, maybe in the, the month or two before the Passover season. Right now, we're not focused on that. We're not even to the fall festivals. So tonight, we're going to keep this topic short. Anyway, we believe that Jesus moved the Passover from the latter part of the 14th to the early part of the 14th. So that event with the disciples took place on the early part of the 14th. 
Let's focus now on the latter part of the 14. The Jews today obviously don't recognize the change that Jesus made because they don't recognize the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. And as a result, these days, I want to ask this question, what are we in the church doing at the very time that the Jews are having their Passover cedar in the latter part of the 14th? Remember that we were doing the bread and the cup and the foot washing on the early part of the 14th. But what are we in the church doing on the latter part of the 14th while the Jews are doing their Passover Seder? Well, we're doing exactly what it says in Exodus 12, 42. Write that down, please. Exodus 12, 42, it says, This is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is a night of the Lord to be observed or other translations say, a night to be much remembered, of all the children of Israel in their generations. So this verse is exactly what we in the church do on the latter part of the 14th. While the Jews are doing their, their Seder observance on the latter part of the 14th, we're celebrating the night to be much observed or the night to be much remembered. So we've got the Passover service or the Lord's Supper service in the church in the early part of the 14th with the bread cup and the foot washing, and then we've got the night to be much observed in the latter part of the 14th. So the last thing that can be said about our Passover observance is that we have discarded it. No, we keep it. And, 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 and let me be really careful how I phrase the following. I'm getting a little off topic, but I think this is kind of fun to talk about. Each of our present day observances that I've just described contain symbolism for both the Old Testament and New Testament. You find the Old Testament in both observances, early part of the 14th. You find the New Testament in both observances, early part and the latter part. But I find that the Passover slash Lord's Supper in the early part of the 14th has a more New Testament crucifixion connotation, while the night to be much observed has more of an Old Testament fleeing from Egypt connotation. And feel free to disagree with me on this. If you don't like it, talk to me in the chat room and we'll try to read your comment. We don't have all the answers here. We're not perfect, okay? Let's get back to David's letter. David writes, In a similar way, Christians throughout the world observe the Lord's Day, Sunday, in lieu of the Sabbath, Saturday. Even though it's a new day, and in a certain sense, we discard the old, the Sabbath is not destroyed, but fulfilled. End quote by David. Now notice that David has used the word discard again. First he used the word discard in the context of the Passover. Now he uses the word discard in the context of the seventh-day Sabbath. And again, we disagree. All right, let's keep reading. Now, now I think I like the following uh, thing that David says. Get this. He says, in both cases, meaning the Passover and the Sabbath, Jesus is the fulfillment. He's our true Passover lamb. He died to redeem sinners. And in him we find our true rest in the one who deliberately and repeatedly made his post-resurrection appearances, uh, get this, on the first day of the week. All right, that's true. Again, neither of these practices destroy, but rather fulfill the law with Jesus being the substance that cast the shadow. End quote. Now, I think that's pretty good stuff. Now, I'm not comfortable with, um, when he goes on to say this, let me quote David when he says, we might note that the apostles never claimed that Jesus explicitly said to stop all animal sacrifices in, in relation to the Passover, but we accept the implication and accept the Christian practice of the Lord's Supper instead, end quote. Again, I don't agree with David's assertion that the Lord's Supper did away with the Passover. And, and I think there's another problem with this last statement that I just read. David feels that the animal sacrifices that we find in the Old Testament are done away with because they have been replaced by the Lord's Supper. And this statement is true, but that's only part of the story. There's more to it because there's actually another reason why the animal sacrifices are gone. And this second reason why the animal sacrifices is gone ties in with what we're going to talk about next week, which is the 613 laws of the Torah. In other words, there are 613 laws in the Torah. What's the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Of those 613 laws, which ones do we keep? 
and which ones do we reject? But even more importantly, we got to ask the question, why do we keep the ones we keep? And why do we reject the ones that we reject? I mean, it's really easy for some minister to divide the 613 laws of the Torah into two groups and say, this list we keep, this one we don't. But they don't give you a good reason why we keep one group or why we ignore uh, the other group. And I think that's something we need to examine. We're going to do that on, on next week's show. But that's for next week. Because next week we're going to talk about why we don't keep the animal sacrifices. And no, it's not, as David says, simply a matter of these sacrifices being replaced by the Lord's Supper. There's more to it than that. All right, finally, David says this. I'm going to quote. He says, even though the apostles don't tell us explicitly in their writings that the Sabbath observance was to transition into keeping of Sunday... I'm glad he says that. He says, we accept the implication of their first day of the week practices and accept the Christian observance of the Lord's Day instead. All right, let's talk about David's thing about what he calls first day of the week practices. I find this point really fascinating. But let's back up a second. Some Protestant churches claim that the law is done away with. We've talked about this on previous shows. We've gone into it in great detail. Now, not all Protestants believe that the law is done away with, but some of them do. They say that the law was nailed to the cross. We've talked about this. They say the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. You can go through our DCM webpage, find the YouTube links to these previous shows. All right, that's the Protestants, some of the Protestants. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, is not in agreement with these antinomian Protestants. And this is a very important distinction. Now, David, our friend, the Catholic, talks about the first day of the week worship practices that he says implies to us that we should observe the Lord's Day as opposed to keeping the seven-day Sabbath. And here's where I have some major problems. First of all, anytime you find the term first day of the week in the Bible, it has absolutely nothing to do with a worship service. There's nothing in Scripture that says or implies that the New Testament church moved their worship from the seventh day to the first day. Second, I, and I need you to help me out on this in the chat room, I believe the term Lord's Day only shows up once in the New Testament. Only once in the New Testament. Revelation 1.10. Now, y'all in the chat room, help me out on this. Correct me if I'm wrong. Because if I am, I want you to tell me. Further, the New Testament term, the Lord's Day, has nothing to do with a particular day of the week. When John was was talked about being in the Lord's day in Revelation 1.10, he was not talking about doing something on a Sunday. A better translation of the term Lord's day in Revelation 10, 1.10 would be the day of the Lord. Because the day of the Lord is a prophetic event that consists of a time period immediately after the tribulation. The day of the Lord is all about some terrible times that are going to envelop the earth. So when John talks about the day of the Lord in Revelation 1.10, he's talking about it with the, uh, talking about it, this day of the Lord, in the same way that it's talked about in Zechariah 14 and Joel 2. Write that down, Zechariah 14, Joel 2, because it talks about the day of the Lord. And that's where John is tying in this revelation vision with these two Old Testament scriptures. Again, the day of the Lord in the New Testament has nothing to do with Sunday or any particular day of the week. Third, I believe that when our friend David talks about the first day of the week, he means that Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. And again, Jesus was not resurrected on the first day of the week. We know that. We've got all kinds of, of studies that have been done that show that that's just not true. He was not resurrected on a Sunday morning. Fourth and finally, by the very admission of the Catholic Church, there's nothing in the Bible telling us to change the seventh-day Sabbath to Sunday. Instead, the Catholic Church claims that it, it changed because they have the authority to change the Sabbath. Now, I'm going to recommend two booklets that go into great detail on these two subjects. The first booklet is called Understanding the Sabbath, and it was written by me. Uh, you can get it by contacting cgi.org and ask for the booklet 
about understanding the Sabbath written by Wes White. You've got to say the one by Wes White because they've got other booklets about the Sabbath. And I want you to read the one I wrote, Understanding the Sabbath, and tell them that Wes sent me to get this book. In this booklet, I go into great detail about this phrase, the first day of the week in the New Testament. And, and this booklet looks at every reference to the first day of the week, and it shows that never does this phrase have anything to do with Jesus' resurrection or a worship service. And this is important stuff. So go, please, to cgi.org and get this booklet. In the booklet, I also quote uh, statements from Protestant churches where they admit that the New Testament nowhere says the Sabbath was done away with. The Protestants admit it, and I've got all kinds of Protestant quotes in there. And I didn't come up with them. i got to confess, I got them from the Bible Sabbath Association. That's where I got them from. They did the homework for me. It was, and in Bible Sabbath Association, another great place to get material on the subject of the Sabbath. All right, then in this booklet, Understanding the Sabbath at CGI.org, I quote from the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church agrees with us that the New Testament nowhere says the Sabbath was done away with. And they're really honest about it because they admit that it was they, the Catholic Church, that changed the Sabbath. They admit it. And they say the following to the Protestant churches that keep Sunday. The Catholic Church says to the Protestant churches, they say, every time you keep Sunday, you're acknowledging the authority of us, the Catholic Church, because you're following our leadership on this point of doctrine. You're not following the Bible. You're following us. You're not obeying the Bible, you're obeying us. All of this is in the booklet I wrote. So please check it out. It's free, cgi.org, Understanding the Sabbath. That's the first booklet I want you to check out. Second booklet I want uh, you to check out, it was written by Robert Coulter, C-O-U-L-T-E-R, Robert Coulter of the Church of God Seventh Day in Denver, Colorado. And someone out there might have a link to uh, these two booklets I'm talking about. Make it easy for you. Robert Coulter's booklet is excellent. It goes into great te detail about what happened from the time Jesus was arre arrested and then interro interrogated, then beaten, and then crucified, and then resurrected. And I mean, Brother Coulter goes hour by hour through all the events that happened crucifixion week. And in the center of the booklet, it's laid out in a timeline. It's just beautifully done. Brother Coulter shows you how to really understand what Jesus was talking about when he said he'd be in the grave for three days and three nights, and you can't get three days and three nights out of a Friday evening crucifixion and a Sunday morning res resurrection. It's just not possible. Again, that booklet can be obtained from the Church of God Seventh Day in Denver, Colorado, written by Robert Coulter. Not Fred Coulter, Robert Coulter. No relationship between these guys. Again, both these booklets are free. There's no charge for e uh, either of them. And after you read them, I'd like you to contact me and let me know what your thoughts are, good or bad. You like them, don't like them. My email address, I always encourage you to write me, wdwhite49 at yahoo.com. And I want to read a couple more quotes. We've got a little extra time. This one was written by Charles Pope. Charles Pope goes way back in the Church God movement. He was one of the founders of Church God International back in 1978. And the following is from uh, a book that Charles wrote called Research into the Faith Once Delivered. And if you're watching tonight, Charles, maybe you can talk to us in the chat room and tell us, uh, our viewers how to get your book. Uh, is it online? Do they have to write somewhere? Anyway, here's what Charles Pope said. He said, the Catholic Church makes the following statement, uh, the following statements to the Protestants in regard to the seventh day Sabbath. Quote, most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day for worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that. Indeed, it is not. The Roman Catholic Church itself, without any scriptural authority from God, transferred the Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday, and try to argue that the change was made in the Bible, and, the, uh, and, and if you try to argue that the change was made in the Bible, it's dishonest, and it's a denial of Catholic authority. Don't you love that? I'm still quoting from Charles. Uh, it says, if Protestantism wants to base its teaching only on the Bible, it's got to worship on Saturday. Still quoting from Charles. Over 100 years ago, Catholic Mirror, it's a magazine of the Catholic Church, it ran a series of articles discussing the right of Protestant churches to worship on Sunday. And it exposes their claim that the New Testament taught Sunday keeping to be false. The New Testament doesn't teach Sunday keeping. The article stressed 
that unless one was willing to accept the authority of the Catholic Church to designate the, that, the day of worship, the Christians should observe Saturday, the true Christian Sabbath, as the Old and the New Testament's teaching. Charles got that from the Catholic Mirror, volume 64, number 34, Saturday, September 2nd, 1893. Charles now editorializes, and he says the Protestant Reformation is an attempt to break away from the quote-unquote commandments of men and base their religious beliefs on the Bible as the only standard of truth for religious activity in worship of God. He, uh, Charles says, through the efforts of Martin Luther and others, the Protestants returned to the teachings of the Bible for doctrine. The issue of the Sabbath being changed to Sunday by the church in Rome was not addressed by the Reformation. That's right, because, and, and I'm getting off, or, or not quoting Charles anymore, because those of us in, in the past who have read uh, the story of Martin Luther were watching how he's seeing indulgences are wrong, uh, uh, um, grace is what we should be thinking of, uh, an unmarried priesthood is wrong, and, and Martin Luther's going through all these things, and we're reading it, and we're going, yes, Martin Luther, go Martin Luther, go Martin, and then when he gets to the Sabbath, he just drops it. And we're saying, Martin, you're this close, keep going. Well, it's too late, he's dead. But, you know, you're reading it and you get yourself immersed and you're thinking, come on, Martin, you can do this. You'll find out about the Sabbath. Well, Martin Luther's going to have to wait until the kingdom of God. All right, back to Charles. Charles says, Sunday as the day of worship has been in place for nearly 400 years by the time of the Reformation. And it is overlooked by the Protestant reformers. They don't want to look at it. They are not willing to break away from the doctrine of the Church of Rome and return to the biblical authority of the seventh day as the day God instituted for his chosen people. Still quoting Charles, Doctrine developed from the foundational principles of the Bible is the dogma of the faith once delivered. So, end quote. Thank you, Charles Pope, for that information. Now, before I turn it over to Nancy to tell us what's going on in the chat room, I want to remind you that we have all kinds of material. Um, you know what? I forgot to put in here. I got something from um, Steve Todd about the Council of Nicaea, and it talks about the Sabbath. And I got distracted with our technical problems. It just came in, I think, today or yesterday. And maybe I can get this in in the future show. All right. Sorry, Steve. I really wanted to get that in. Now, before I uh, turn this over to Nancy for the chat room, uh, I want to remind you that we have all kinds of new material on the website, rldea.com. Brandy and Stephanie have posted a whole bunch of printables. And remember, the printables are these um, uh, transcriptions of Ron's Bible studies. We haven't changed his wording one little bit. We just took his, his words as he spoke them. We've got them printed and in, in nice laid, nicely laid out. You can print these things. Which is why they're called printables. They're called printables. They're and appropriate you, for printing. Yes, and you, uh, you print them, punch three holes, and put them in a notebook. It's a great Bible study. And then we've even added... 10 Bible study questions that help you to understand the material. So you can use them at church or your Bible study group to get everybody yeah. start thinking and talking yeah. about what whatever the, the material is. Exactly. And this is something that Stephanie and Brandy do, and they're doing a fabulous job on this. Cranking them out. Cranking them out. Okay. We also have a new 21st Century Thinker episode, which talks about German prisoners of war that were held in Wisconsin during World War II. Cool. What's that one called? It's called uh, German POWs in Wisconsin. Ironically enough. Yeah, isn't that an interesting title? All right. So uh, we're always adding new stuff to the website, rldea.com. So if it's been a week or so since you've checked it out, what you saw a week ago has been updated. you got to go back in and see all the new stuff. It's so a dynamic site. It's a uh, dynamic be site. Before we switch to other things, someone in the chat room at uh, on YouTube wants to know, what was the name of that book by Robert Coulter? I'm not sure, but uh, oh. <laughs> I'm hoping somebody finds That's it. It's an odd it's, name for a book. No, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it's about three days and three nights. I think it was the three days of entombment. Oh. By, uh, and again, the key is Robert Coulter. And if you contact Church God Seventh Day and say, I want the books about Jesus three days and three nights in the tomb by Robert Coulter, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And they'll say, and it might be online. I hope You might I, be able to Google it. Yeah, and I think the word is entombment, I think. Entombment. Yes, I couldn't find it in my library. I loaned it out. I shouldn't loan my stuff out. What else you got for us, Nancy? <clears throat> okay, um, 
Brian uh, Numeric wants to know, he's curious, were there any more recent quotations from the Catholics on this topic? No, because, and, and here's the reason, here's what I believe is the reason why we don't have any recent uh, um, explanations by the Catholics and the Protestants. These are old uh, things from the 1800s. Because once the Sabbath-keeping uh, movement uh, got started and took off, I mean, there, there are Sabbath keepers out there all over the place. You may not know about them because they're not in an organized religion, but there are tons of Sabbath keepers out there. Once that movement took off and, and these people realized what their admissions were doing, they, they basically stopped talking about it. And that's why you don't see a lot of stuff. Back in the 1800s, when we, when we get all these things, they're pretty safe. They're not worried about it. But since the Sabbath keeping movement has taken off, they realize we got to stop admitting this stuff, and they just basically don't talk about it. Okay. So, sorry we don't have something better for you. Okay, uh, we're glad that you, all of you joined us tonight. Um, Positive Dennis on YouTube has a few comments about my segment. He says, hmm, I still get straws. There might be a city somewhere that has a ban, but not the state of California. If I said the state of California, then um, I didn't mean that. Uh, individual cities have some restrictions. Maybe ban is the wrong word. Um, positive Dennis said, also says the Greek word agape means love. So you're saying love, love. Agape is not a special kind of love. It's just a different word translated love, I guess. Yeah, that's like, um, it's a redundancy. Agape and love is a redundancy. Kind of like when you talk about the baseball team, the Los Angeles Angels? Yeah. The, the, it's You're saying the angels, the angels. It's kind of a redundancy when you're mixing two languages together. So like agape is a, a word that's translated love, but yeah. it's not the only word yeah, translated and, and, love. And, and there's distinction between right. the usage of the words? Yeah, and that's why we say agape love, because there's phileo love and there's eros love. There are three kind of love. Agape means godly love, uh, ph uh, phileo love uh, uh, means brotherly love, and we get the name Philadelphia from that. And then we have eros love, which we get the word erotic from, which means um, more of a romantic or sexual love. So, so once you explain it, you don't need to say agape love. Right, you can just but, say agape. but when we're dealing with people in the, in the Bible study environment like this, we say agape love. Because if we just said love, in the English language, there's only one word for love, and people can get confused. Mm -hmm. But then if you only say agape, people are saying, what's that word? It's like when we say ecclesia all the time, people get confused. What's an ecclesia? Yeah. And we have to. So anyway, we say agape love because we want to differentiate and in between the three Greek words and show the audience that it has the word love because not everybody out there knows these things. Okay. Okay, and then one more comment from Positive Dennis: Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I come to, uh, I come to discard. I think that might be a typo. I don't know. I don't okay. Know. Anyway, thanks, Positive Dennis, for um, speaking here and uh, making some comments. And then the other question was about Fred Coulter, so I answered that. Let me point out, Bob Petty said his um, Passover was expanded, not discarded. That's a very good way to put it. Mm -hmm. it. Passover was not exactly right. In the same way that Jesus expanded the law by saying it used to be that if the only way you could commit adultery was to do the act. He says, now... I'm expanding it, and I'm saying if you do it in your heart, you're guilty, just as guilty as if you mm -hmm. actually did it. And and I think Bob Petty, that's what he's saying, and that's a real good way of putting it. What Jesus did was he didn't discard uh, the uh, Passover. He expanded the Passover. Thank you, Bob. Very good. That's true. Uh, Mark Salas says, uh, the cunning of the dragon is powerful. He's a great deceiver, and certainly he has deceived us, right? Yeah. Are many people. Dan Krantz said it's a good time for uh, plugging Ron's book, The Thread, God's yes. Point Village History. The, all right, let's do that. Let's plug Ron's book. We've got some uh, commercials we're working on now where um, we're going to play these 30 second commercials and they'll be plugging Ron's book. And you can go to uh, Amazon.com and get these books. The Thread, uh, Ron says, all throughout man's history, there's this thread. And it's the plan of God. And he, and he talks about God's annual high days at great length. And, and let me say this about the annual high days. Some people say you can prove the plan of salvation through God's annual high days. I don't think that's correct. 
But, and you may disagree. You may say, yeah, you can prove the plan, God's plan of salvation through the annual high days. Excuse me. But I look at it this way. Looking at God's annual high days connects all the dots. We take all the information that we have about you know, the prophecies of Amos and Zechariah and Daniel and Revelation and Matthew 24, put them all together, and we get a real good picture of the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. Then we take God's annual high days and lay them side by side, and we say, oh, that fills in a lot of the dots. Anyway, Ron's book, The Thread, shows how it fills in the dots. I don't think he uses that term in the book. I, I haven't found it in there. But it, it's essentially what he's saying in that. So, yeah, uh, check out Ron's book, The Thread, Amazon.com. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Flum recommends uh, the website truthontheweb.org uh, for finding out more information about this. And Bill Bratt recommends uh, Rome's Challenge. You can read it online at wbcg.org. Very good. Okay, so there's plenty of resources online. And then uh, Sharon Lewis says, the best discourse about Sunday worship is from the Horse's Mouth Google Cardinal McGibbon. So is that where you you had a thing there? Was that from the Horse's Mouth, your quote that you were... That I you think so, but I'm not sure. Okay. We got some good uh, comments about Bill, uh, good advice on uh, from the scriptures on Bill. Uh, so uh, it, it seem, people seem to... Uh, uh, get a lot out of that. So good job, Bill. Okay, Richard Maxwell also says um, that Jesus said he was the Lord of the Sabbath. God sanctified and made it the holy the seventh day of the week. And that the Catholic Church points out that the uh, Seventh-day Adventists are keeping the right day. Yeah. Brian Numerick makes a point uh, regarding Bill's message. And let me add an amen to this. Now, this is a really difficult principle. He says, My mom taught me if you don't have something productive to say, Keep your mouth shut because words can be very problematic. This we got to be real careful with this, brethren, because um, I know one guy got on me. He said, "Well, you should always ask the question: Is it true? Is it positive? Is it helpful? Is it this or is it that?" Mm -hmm. And that's a real good thing to go by, but you can't always go by that. For example, suppose there's a church organization out there that's ripping people off. Mm -hmm. and, and taking the tithes and offerings and spending them on things that they got no business spending them, you probably might want to mention that to other people, people that you know are giving money there. And, I, and we could come up with all kinds of examples. If you do that, you're violating this thing about is it true, is it positive? Is it's it, a four-way test that the Rotary Club has. Uh, okay, that's right. The Rotarians do that, mm -hmm. right. And, and they do that in their club because you should do that in a club. And, and I think that's good for Christians if we do that the vast majority of the time. Mm -hmm. But there comes a time when you really got to say, uh-uh, this really stinks. Mm -hmm. And, and I got to point this out. Yeah, so, sure. so we have to be careful with that. And I'm not disagreeing with Brian Numerick. I'm saying that, uh, that we got to find the uh, right balance in this. Absolutely. Uh, I want to mention that Amy Hohertz has a prayer request for yes. tendonitis in her left knee that has pain and swelling. So all right, remember Amy, Amy Hohertz in your prayers. All right, I want you all to put that on your prayer list, please. Mm -hmm. Amy Hohertz, you know Amy. She's the one that's always picking on me in the chat room. I love you, Amy. And she's having tendonitis in her elbow, right? Mm -hmm. Or knee. Or mm -hmm. knee, in her knee. So please put that on your prayer list. And you're writing down scriptures, write that down too, or otherwise you're going to forget. That's right. And you think, oh, maybe I'll, rem I think I'll, rem no, no, don't take a chance. Write it down. And tomorrow when you wake up, you're getting ready to go to church, be praying about Amy. While you're in church, do some praying about Amy. Because we are a people who believe in the miracle of prayer. The power of we, prayer. we believe in, in uh, anointing. We believe that God loves us and he wants what's best for us. And brethren, we're not going to the Lord enough in prayer asking for healing. And, and I don't want to turn us into uh, Benny Hinn where, you know, you, I ask you to put your hand on the TV. and we're, It doesn't work that way. But not like these guys on TV do it. But God does heal. And, and he heals through prayer, the prayer of the righteous. So always remember these prayer requests. Write them down. Put them in your Bible so that next time you go and do your Bible study, you're going to run across those prayer requests. We need to be a praying church, brethren, so remember Amy. Absolutely. Uh, Jeffrey Flum, going back to uh, Bill's segment, says, uh, Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
And Michael, that's part of the closure. Michael Thaleman says, Sabbath is good after six days of work. Yeah. Now, that's an if, important if principle. You're, if you're working hard for six days, you need you the Sabbath. You love it. You love the Sabbath. Yeah. But, but remember, Exodus 20 doesn't just say, rest on the seventh day. There's two parts. The first part says you got to work six days. And we've got a responsibility to work. Now, I know some some people out there are too sick to work. Uh, they're they're uh, not capable because of their health or their age. I get that. But if you're capable of working, you need to get out there and work. And even if you're between jobs, don't be sitting around the house all day. Find something constructive to do. Get some work done because there's two parts to that. Exodus 20, the fourth commandment, first part is you got to work six days. And then the seventh, then you get your seventh day off. So don't turn all seven days into a, um, a, a, a day of rest. Okay. Um, going back to my segment, Brian Numeric uh, says, I think loving your neighbor requires a great deal of humility. That's true. We have to think about um, when we love our neighbors, uh, you know, we put them first. And that's the major tenet of humility, isn't it? Yes, Absolutely. What have you got? Do you have anything in YouTube? Have you checked that out? Uh, I started out in YouTube. Okay, so we've covered YouTube. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. What else do we have? Uh, Richard Maxwell says, the focus of your conversation is the focus of your heart. Exactly. Out of the abundance of the heart, heart the mouth speaketh. And, and, you know, if you want to know where someone's treasure is, where their heart is, sit there and listen to them talk. And if, you're, if your mind is always on... Uh, the politics that are going on in Washington, or and, and, and if your mind is always on the Dallas Cowboys, that's where your heart is. And there's nothing wrong with talking about politics. There's nothing wrong with voting. There's nothing wrong with being a Cowboys fan, all these things. But if that's where your primary conversation is, there's something wrong. Because in, in Christianity, we've got to be thinking about Philippians 4, 8. Think on these things, Absolutely. these things that are just and righteous and all these. Turn to Philippians 4, 8. That's where our mind has to be. We've got to be concentrating on those things and not on all the negative stuff or all the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. So so let's have our, 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 our minds and our conversation on this and then our heart will follow us there. Richard, uh, excellent point, Dave. Uh, Richard Maxwell also points out if you love God with your heart, uh, with all your heart, you keep the first four laws of the of God. Uh, I believe he means the Ten Commandments. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, you keep the the others and uh, mm -hmm. the other six. And um, I've often said and heard it said at church that uh, that defines how you love. So you mm -hmm. can say I love somebody, but if you love them, you don't steal, you don't bear false witness, yep. you don't covet what they have. Things yeah. like how do you love your neighbor? Well, here's how. Here's some things you don't do. Yeah. Here's something interesting by Bill Bratt. Now, I'm, I wasn't aware of this. I'm going to check this out. Bill Bratt says, in the latest Catholic catechism, their, com uh, their uh, comments about the Sabbath sound a lot like the Protestants. And so, um, like I said, they've wised up. Yeah. Uh, they're not into this thing about admitting the Bible. The New Testament doesn't say it got changed. And we have the authority. Remember, the reason they, what's the reason that the Catholic Church says they have the authority to change the Sabbath? Here's their reason. They say that first the church existed, and then the Bible existed. And they say, we put the Bible together. We selected the books. That's not true. That is not true. We've talked about that on this show. But even if they did, they, here's what they say. The chronology is that we, the church, have preeminence over the Bible because we were before the Bible and we created the Bible. Therefore, just because the Bible doesn't say something doesn't mean that we can't make a change. And that's where they used to come from. But it sounds like Bill Bratt saying they've uh, moved away from that. They figured it out. Yeah. Uh, Rod Kuzman says, find Sabbath keeper, keepers in your local area on uh, Map Google 119. Um, and so if you're out there and you need a place to fellowship, um, uh, check it out and find a group. Because I, I realize that not everybody in the, in the local areas can find a place to fellowship. Because they're just not there. Especially if you live in like Montana or North Dakota. But those of you who are in bigger metropolitan areas can keep the Sabbath. And granted, you're going to have to do it with a group that you might not agree with them on a lot of stuff. But go anyway. 
even and just ignore what they say. And if there's a sermon given on a subject that you know is wrong, don't argue with people about it after church. Just keep it to yourself. Go home, pray about it. But but it's really helpful for us to be with other Sabbath keepers, not just electronically. So if you can go to church somewhere else, go to church somewhere on the Sabbath. Don't stay home. Okay. And um, Brian uh, Numerick mentions that in today's culture, most people seem to take it personal um, when we disagree, as a personal attack when we disagree. Yeah, who said that? Uh, Brian Numerick. Very good, Brian. We should never take an attack on what we believe or disagreement with what we believe as a personal attack on us. Mm -hmm. If nobody, if I disagree with you on a theological topic, it doesn't mean I hate you. It doesn't mean that I think you're an evil person. It doesn't mean that I think you're stupid. It's just that we have a fundamental disagreement on something. Can't we have a fundamental disagreement without taking it personally, which then causes offense? And then what happens then? The friendship is gone. And this is not what Jesus was talking about when he said, by this, they shall know that you are mine. He said that you will have perfect understanding of the Bible. Is that what he said? No, he didn't say that. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are mine, that you have love for one another. So we've got to be able to disagree on this stuff without taking it so personal and breaking up friendships over this kind of stuff. We just can't do that. Absolutely true. Uh, two things that really aren't specifically about tonight. Um, though uh, Terry Lucenhide mentioned that they celebrated their 30th anniversary. And, oh, really? Yeah. Their, their 30th? Well, Bill, you never <laughs> told us that was coming. It wasn't on Facebook. Well, happy anniversary. Poor Terry has been putting up with him for 30 years. Yeah. All right, I have a prayer request. Please pray for <coughs> Terry that she have the strength and the fortitude to continue to put up with Bill. And I'm just kidding because <laughs> Bill's a wonderful guy. I love you, Bill. Okay. But congratulations. Happy anniversary. Number 30. That's wonderful. That is great, and I wanted to mention that Amy Hohertz gave us the, gave us the countdown. Ten days till Trump, the Feast of Trumpets, Right. 19 till the Day of Atonement, and 24 till the Feast of Tabernacles. 24 till the Feast. Less than a month. Less than a month. Mark Salas says, repay no one for, for evil. Live peaceably with all men. Do not avenge yourselves. Vengeance is mine. That's a, excellent. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Mark. That's an excellent scripture. Live peaceably with other people. We, we just don't need this fighting. We just don't need it. Absolutely. What else you got, sweetie? We're about to shut this down. Okay. Uh, so I've got um, a comment from Richard Maxwell. I don't always agree with you, but I agree to disagree. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Charles Robert makes a good comment. He said, more and more people will leave the Catholic Church and join a Sabbath-keeping church if they keep talking about the real Sabbath. I think what he's saying is if they keep admitting the truth about the Sabbath, people are going to say, oh, I need to keep the Sabbath, and they're going to lose people. Yeah, yeah. So they, they learned that lesson in the 1800s. They don't want to do it, and they wish that we didn't have all these quotes, I'm sure. When it comes to that, honesty is not necessarily the best policy, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Here's Amy Hohorts. After I said that about Bill, she said, I pray the same for Nancy White because she has to put up with Wes, and she's had to do it for way too long. Amy Man, that girl, always, always I, aggravating I me. think we need to wrap this up now. Amy, you're in trouble. Okay. You're going to be in church tomorrow. We're going to have a talk. There we go. No, we're just kidding. I love Amy. She's a wonderful girl. I've known her since she was a bratty little girl, and now she's a bratty adult. Okay. okay. Well, let's, let's close with prayer. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for the time that we've had together. We thank you so much for the love that we have for one another. Help us to let our light shine so that we might always glorify you as we keep your seventh day holy. We know that we're not saved by this day. We know that we're saved by the blood of Jesus. But we keep this seventh day because it's a gift from you to us. It is a blessing, and we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for the time that we had tonight to discuss the Sabbath. Now, Father, please be with us tomorrow, uh, those of us who are able to go to a, a fellowship with a, a, a live church service. Please give safety to everyone. Please put your spirit and your love in the entire ecclesia as they go about their obedience to you. We are so grateful to you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for everything. We give you praise and thanks and ask for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. All right, one last thing, and I think we're ready to shut this down. Okay. Have, Have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. All right, we'll shut, shut it down. You're going to shut that down, sweetie? Thank you. Save me a trip. Iced tea. Here.